the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. I'm Pastor Steve Woodfin from Our Shepherd Lutheran Church in Birmingham, Michigan. OurShepherd.net is the way to find us. This is morning prayer for December the 8th, 2020. And it's kind of Christmassy. I mean, it is the season. And I don't get a chance to wear Christmas ties that often. Certainly not on Sundays when I'm wearing a clerical collar. So I thought I'd wear a Christmas tie this morning to uh, just kind of set the theme. And the theme is this beautiful prophecy from Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, talking about how he's going to come and rescue the children of Israel. And then also a beautiful writing from C.F.W. Walther, um, a father of the, of the American Lutheran Church. Um, and he writes about uh, the power of God and how he manifests that power through his word during this time while we wait for Christ to return again. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Isaiah, chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless, ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the deity in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab shall be trampled down in his place, as straw is trampled down in a dunghill. And he will spread out his hands in the midst of it, as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hands, and the high fortifications of his walls he will bring down, lay low, and cast to the ground, to the dust. I love reading the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. And there's over 300 of them that Jesus fulfilled in his very short time on earth. That's one thing that we can share with people around us who aren't familiar with God's word. And just to point out that, wow, you know, over 1,500 years before Christ walked the earth, prophecies began being written down about him, and he fulfilled them all. You know, it just might give them an interesting perspective on historical writing, and then also talking about the, the historical accuracy of the Old Testament, too. You know, we're talking about uh, uh, apologetics with the confirmation class this year, how to talk with people who don't trust God's word, how to talk with people who don't know God or have any understanding of how much he loves them. Uh, and that's one way that we, we, uh, we do that is to point out that the historical accuracy of the Old Testament is far, far beyond any other historical writings that we have that we trust in completely. Writings like Socrates and Plato, things that we just, just say are, are, are truthful, that we trust in. Well, the Old Testament and the New Testament, too, are extremely reliable, orders of magnitude more reliable than the writings that we trust every day in our secular world. So there, there's, a moment, there's just a moment of apologetics training there as well. But um, it's just glorious, glorious to see Isaiah under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit talking about the birth of the Savior. Now, God's power in this time in between while we wait for Christ to return again. Here's what C.F.W. Walther wrote. Who then has the power in this kingdom? It's Jesus Christ alone. He declares this of himself. He says, I am a king. I am the good shepherd. One is your master, even Christ. 
The apostle calls him the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. By which means Christ exercises the power in his church, though he has withdrawn his visible presence from it and sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, is clearly shown by this last declaration with which he parted from his disciples. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Hence, his word, accompanied and sealed by the holy sacraments, is the means whereby Christ exercises power in his kingdom. This is the right scepter with which he rules his people. This is the rod and staff with which he feeds his flock. And so getting back to apologetics again, uh, we instruct the confirmands that all the tools that apologetics gives us, they're all designed to do one thing, to lead people to God's word, to lead them to the truth, to lead them to a place where they can begin to trust that God's word is reliable, that it truly is his word, and that it does the things that it says it will do. All power that Christ exercises over his church during this time while we wait for him comes from his glorious word. And so what a blessing we are, we, uh, we have that we're able to spend time in his word each morning and evening as we have been during this pandemic. All right, we're going to pray, What is the World to Me? from uh, uh, hymn number 730 in the Lutheran Service Book, and then we'll pray a closing prayer as well. What is the world to me with all its vaunted pleasure when you and you alone, Lord Jesus, are my treasure? You only, dearest Lord, my soul's delight shall be. You are my peace, my rest. What is the world to me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, in holy baptism, you anointed us with your Holy Spirit and healed us of all sin, making us little Christs who bear in our body your Son, our Savior. Continue to strengthen us by your Holy Spirit and your word so that we may be embody Christ in the world through our words and in our actions. We pray this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's uh, close with Luther's morning prayer as well. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Have a glorious day in the Lord.